if you just believe in the crazy metaphors and don't think too hard about what they're telling you, you will also come to understand that Ethereum is ultrasound money and that it doesn't matter that a cabal of insiders control every aspect of the token. What's up YouTube, it's Borat back at it again with another video. Today I'm gonna be showing you guys how to display whatever data you want on your Block Clock Mini using the Block Clock Mini API. At the beginning of the video here, we're gonna start off with the most simple use case of the Block Clock Mini API and throughout the video, we're gonna level up to more and more complex scenarios, but just know that you can show whatever data you want. You're only going to be limited by what data is available to you and what data is easy to pull into the Block Clock Mini. So if you guys watch the end of the video, we're gonna be controlling the Block Clock Mini from our iPhones. We're gonna be displaying Federal Reserve data on the Block Clock Mini, and I might just integrate the Block Clock Mini with Gemini and start to display Ethereum data on the Block Clock Mini. The last Block Clock Mini review that I did, where I said that the quote on the Block Clock Mini was a little edgy, spawned some of these these tweets letting me know how early we are and how this isn't a safe space for my feelings. And so this is what I had to say to that guy. And I hope that by putting Ethereum price data on the Block Clock Mini, I can really trigger some maximalists into talking more about me on Twitter because I'm super petty and that's the that I live for. So go down below and smash the like button for the Block Clock Mini API and let's level up your brain. All right, so here's the documentation for the Block Clock Mini API. But if you haven't done any programming before, it might be a little overwhelming to you to look at this for the first time and really understand what you have to be doing to use this. So real quick, what we're going to do is copy the second line here, curl HTTP 1004 show text hello. We're gonna copy that. And then we're gonna open up a new terminal window. So we've got our terminal window here and we're gonna hit paste. And we're going to note that this 10 00104 is not actually the URL for my block clock mini. So if we go back here to the documentation, we'll see first of all that only HTTP is supported. You must be on the same LAN network as the block clock. This is really important and it's the reason that we can't actually put this script up into AWS and run it from there because the AWS computer is obviously not on your home local area network. So we're gonna have to do this locally on our own machines. And then finally, you'll note here, these examples assume your block clock mini is using the IP address 10.0.0.1. 104, and we'll see that my block clock mini is actually using, you can't really see it too well up here, but it's using 10.00.175. And so when you log into your block clock mini display page here, your number for the IP address of your block clock mini might be different than my number, and it might be different than the stock number that is showing here in the API. You're probably not gonna have 104. So I'm gonna replace mine with, again, 175. So if we come back here and we just type 175, when we hit enter, you should see empty reply from server, bruh, what? All right, so of course, because we're recording right now, uh, none of these things worked and I got an empty reply from server error. If you are getting that error, what I was able to do to get around it here was just unplugging and replugging in the block clock mini. So now let's try this again and show the text ret yt if we hit enter here and there it goes. So this is the very basic way that this block clock mini API works is you're basically pinging a get request or this curl command to the API endpoint here on your block clock mini. So this first part of the URL here is your Block Clock Mini's local IP address. The second part, this API show text, is where you can show whatever text you want on the Block Clock Mini. And we'll go over some more complicated examples here next in a second. If we go back to the quick examples here and we copy this third one, you can see here it's showing a number, 12,999, and a pair USD BTC and a symbol Bitcoin. And so if we paste this in here in our terminal again, and we remember to give it our correct IP address of our Block Clock Mini, and then we hit enter. All right, and of course here, can't be a demo without little mistakes, so trying it again here, and there it goes. You can see that the pair is that first thing that's showing up there in the leftmost block, uh, and that's USD BTC, and then the symbol. There are three different symbols that you can show. You can show the Bitcoin symbol, the Litecoin symbol, and the USD symbol, and that's showing up in front of the number that we posted, 12999, and if you post a number that's too big, it'll overflow and we'll show sort of what that looks like here in a second. So let's say that instead of BTC USD, we wanted to show maybe LTC USD symbol Litecoin. And let's say that Litecoin 
it actually it blew up and now it's at 200,000 litecoins or whatever. So if we hit enter here, we'll get a good error here. This error says, please wait 11.2 seconds. And this basically gets back to the e-ink display of the block clock mini. And you can see this in the documentation down here under rate limiting. Because of the limited update rate of e-ink displays, you should only update the display every five minutes and no more frequently. So by doing a lot of these API calls at once, we're actually like shortening the life of our block clock mini, I guess, because you're not supposed to update e-ink displays all the time. And so it says if you exceed a rate of once per minute, your program will receive a 429 error, which is what we just got and a message about the required delay. So we waited not enough time. We had to await another 11 seconds. And now that I've you know talked and filled that 11 seconds, if we just hit up and try to do that command again, you'll see that there it goes. And so in this case, actually, the number was so big that I think it took off that Litecoin symbol. So let's try this again with a smaller number, maybe more realistic to the Litecoin price, maybe 200. So I think a minute has passed here and let's just try to execute this command again. And there it goes. And you can see that little Litecoin symbol there in front of the 200. So this is sort of a very basic use case of how to update the block clock mini with text and numbers. And you can do the same thing down here with stuff like updating the amount of time that it's gonna take to cycle through to your next indicator, or you can reboot the system, or you can power down, or you can do fancy things here with the lights, or you can add over text and under text to certain blocks in the block clock mini. So you can do all sorts of things, but this was just a basic, how does this work? And so next, let's Let's take a look at how can we pull this functionality, this very basic thing that we've done into a little bit more complicated of a scenario in using Siri shortcuts to actually make these updates straight from our phones or from our Macs. So here I have a Siri shortcut just up on my Mac. I'm using my phone and my iPad to film where I would show it on there. But down in the description, I'll have a link to this Siri shortcut. So you should just be able to pull it onto your phone, edit your IP address up here to whatever yours is for your block clock mini, and then just get using this right away. So if we hit play here, it's gonna say, what would you like to do with your block clock mini? We can change text, number, or lights. Let's do a lights demo here. It's giving us the option for red, blue, green, white, or custom. The custom option is going to allow you to enter any three to eight digit color hex value in the form of RGB, RGBW, or this long one, RRGGBBWW. And so let's enter an eight digit one and let's do red. So one, one, zero, 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 zero. And if we hit done, now our block clock mini should be showing red. And if we hit done again, you can't really see it. You can see it a little bit here maybe, but there are red lights on the back of the block clock mini now. And then if we wanted to turn those lights off, we could just play the shortcut again, hit change lights, done, turn lights off. And now hopefully you can see that the lights are off on the block clock mini. And just a proof of concept for the text here again, let's hit change text and let's display level up your brain, YouTube, done, loibit. All right, and then been having some issues here, but I think I fixed it. If you just come up here and click change number, let's just do 8675309, we'll hit enter and there it goes. And so really this Siri shortcut is gonna be super good for changing the lights, updating the text or doing very basic numbers like the one that we just did there. The Siri shortcut, I'm going to need to build it out a little more to have it able to do, you know, the Bitcoin symbol and some price data and stuff like that. And working in shortcuts is very frustrating. So next, let's jump into a little bit more complicated of a scenario where we're displaying actual data that we've pulled from the Fed's website and putting that onto the block clock with proper formatting and making it look really nice like a lot of the other block clock out of the box indicators look. So if you guys aren't programmers, and you don't have Python installed on your computers, I'm gonna leave a link to a video that I did a long time ago about how to install Python on either Mac or Windows. You're gonna need Python to do some of the stuff that we are using in this video, just basically pulling the data down from the Fed and then posting that data up on our block clock just by manipulating these URLs the same way that we've been doing this the entire time. Really, this whole thing is just built on how can I manipulate this URL that I'm posting to my block clock mini. So if you've already mastered messing around with your block Block clock mini like we did in the very first section of this video. All we're doing now is pulling data from somewhere else and saying, how can I mess up this URL to display exactly what I want it to show? So I've created this new file called block clock YouTube demo.py. I'm going to show you step by step how we're going to use Python to push any data that we want onto our block clock. The first thing that we're going to need is we're going to need to import requests which is a Python package that if you don't have installed, you're just gonna have to go into your terminal and do pip install requests. 
So let's say I didn't have it, I would just come in here and write pip install requests. And if you get stuck at any point, I'll have all of these steps that you need to do down in the description. You'll see that mine already says requirement already satisfied. Um, but if you have never used requests before, you're gonna need to import those requests for yourself. And that's basically just allowing us to build that URL and post data to our block clock the same exact way that we've been doing this whole video. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna have an address and we're gonna make this address equal to whatever the IP address of our block clock is. So 0 0.0175. Let's give it a couple variables now. The first number we're gonna give it is gonna be the number of subscribers of this channel. So right now it's about 4,080. Next, we're gonna give it a pair and we're gonna call this pair YT over subs. And then for the top line, let's say the top line is gonna be Rhett Reisman level up your brain. And for the bottom right, let's call it a number of subscribers. And then we'll give it the URL is gonna be HTTP and then our address and then API. And then next we're gonna make this big if statement to say if it's gonna be text, we're going to add the text stuff to the URL. If it's a number, we're gonna add the number stuff to the URL. If it's a pair, we're gonna add the pair code to the URL. Same thing for symbol. And then the same thing for the top line in the bottom right. And then we're just gonna print the URL here at the bottom and we're going to ping this URL that we've built. So basically what we've done is we've said our base URL is going to be this. And then if we have certain aspects, like if we had a text variable, we would do, we would show the text, but we don't have a text variable in this case. So we have a number variable. And so now it's going to show this number. And if we have a pair, it will show a pair. And if we have a symbol, it will show a symbol. And if we have a top line and a bottom right, it will do those as well. Let's go ahead and execute this code. And we'll see if I zoom in here, maybe you can see that it says Rhett Reisman level up your brain here in the top. And then down here in the bottom, it says number of subscribers. And it did, you know, the exact same thing that we told it to do basically. So now we sort of have a framework that we can fill this data with anything that we want. So next, let's jump over to the Fed's website and see how we can pull data from the Fed and post that into our block clock. I'll have a couple links down in the description related to the St. Louis Fed. The first one is going to be this API keys link where you can view or request new free API keys to pull data from the St. Louis Fed. And then the second link that I'll have is just this general Fed API documentation where you can see, you know, if we click into series observations down here, basically this is going to give us the values of different series or pieces of data on the Fed's website. So for example, if we went over to the M2 data, you'll see up here in the URL, this M2 data is called series M2NS. And you can see here M2NS is like the code of the series that the Fed is identifying the M2 data by. And then down here, you have the observation. The most recent observation is 21,716. And that, that unit is billions of dollars. So right now, the M2 supply of the United States is you know $21 trillion, right? And you can see down here before the pandemic, it was only $15 trillion. So let's say we wanted to pull this M2NS, how would we do that? First, we're gonna to need to go over to this API keys link and we're gonna request or view our Fed API keys. You'll see that I already have one down here, but if you wanted to create a new one, you would just click on request API key right here. That's gonna take you to this screen. You're gonna to agree to their terms of services and then tell them why you need their API keys basically. So maybe you'd say, want to display values onto my block clock mini. And then you would click request API key down here. I'm not going to do it because I've already requested one and I only need one. Once you have that API key, you're gonna put it up here into your Fred key variable. I'll have all this code down in the description as well. So you can just straight copy this and have it run on your own block clock and not have to do any of this programming. Basically what we're doing here is we're connecting to the St. Louis Fed's website. We're giving it our API Fred key. We're getting the response in JSON. And then here is where we're giving it the series ID. In this case, we're doing M2. So that M2NS that we saw on the website. And then down here to format it, I just gave it the pair M2USD and I gave it the title, you know, Board of Governors, Federal Reserve System. That's where the data is coming from. And then I gave it trillions of dollars because, you know, billions of dollars are going to take up a lot of space on the block clock. And I'm basically just dividing by a thousand up here on whatever the most recent observation is from the Fed. So now if we save and run this code, we can see that now on our block clock, if you look down here, M2USD, 
USD, Board of Governors, Federal Reserve System, and this is 21.72 trillions of dollars. And if we go back to the Fed website and we look at M2NS, we can see that, you know, it is in fact 21.716 or 21.2 trillions of dollars. And now what we can do is we can take the exact same code and we can copy instead the federal total public debt or any other economic data from the Fed website. I actually got the idea to show the total public debt on the Block Clock Mini from the guys over at Blue Collar Bitcoin. I was talking to them on Twitter and they suggested that we show this data. So if you haven't heard of their podcast and you are sort of tired of the more serious rigid conversations that are happening in Bitcoin and you want something very educational, but also very upbeat and approachable, I'll leave the link to their podcast page down in the description and then specifically to an episode with NVK, who is the creator of the Block Clock. Definitely highly recommend that episode. They cover a lot of really great stuff around Bitcoin security and the cold card as a storage option. So let's go ahead and try to show this data here. We'll copy this little code here. We'll come back to the script that we wrote and we'll basically just paste this where we had M2 series ID here. And now it's going to be, you know, the series ID for the total national debt. And we'll get rid of this divide by a thousand. All right. So going to do another run of the code here and just see what this looks like when we put the national debt data on the block clock. So you'll see it's a little poorly formatted. I put the USD in there, but obviously the debt is too big. And so it actually cut off the first two here and it's just showing 91677.22. I'm going to go in and mess around with the code a little bit and then I'm going to redeploy it and see if we can get it to look a little bit better here. Okay. Okay, so now instead of dividing by a thousand and showing billions of dollars, I'm showing trillions of dollars and dividing by a million. And so this should hopefully get us less decimal points and a better looking display on the block clock. So let's go ahead and run this code again and see what it looks like. So there you go. Now you're seeing 29.62 debt of USD, and that's going to say trillions of dollars down at the bottom. And at the top, it's going to give you, you know, whatever we programmed in here, source US Department of the Treasury Fiscal Service. And so you'll see that that matches this observation up here. And so really, you can display whatever data you want. This is just one example, and I'll have the code for all these examples down in the description. And so that's how you're able to pull data from specifically the Fed's website and really get any indicator that you want into your or block clock mini. There is some manual work in just getting it to show up in the way that you want and showing stuff like obviously now the measurement is not millions of dollars anymore because we had to divide by a million just to get it to show up on the block clock in a way that's, you know, aesthetic. And then there's some more manual work around obviously adding a symbol and getting your source of data from the Fed and putting that in here in a way that, you know, you want it to show up, but you could really show anything here, right? You could say instead of source, you could say, like debt of US economy, this is not great. And then you might have seen at different points in this video, if you just wait long enough after you make a call like this to present whatever you want onto the Block Clock Mini, if you wait long enough, your normal cycle that you've programmed in the web interface will kick back into whatever your next thing is. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, if I go into my Block Clock Mini display here and I just click next, it's gonna go back to the Moscow memes time. And if I hit next again, you know, the same thing is going to happen. Okay guys, so now we know how you can display literally whatever you want on your Block Clock Mini. It's just gonna be down to what data can you pull and what data can you not pull in an easy way in a Python script. But next, let's see how we can actually work this into the normal rotation of our block clock mini values. This is going to be a little bit more in depth and not really inside the scope of this video. I have done some other tutorials on this channel about how you can easily automate things using AWS, but unfortunately we can't run block clock mini update scripts from AWS because we have to be in our local area network and not up on a cloud machine that's in some random place basically. And so I'm going to leave this article down in the description about how you can automate any Python script on Windows or on Mac. And then I'm also going to be linking this video here on YouTube, how to schedule Python scripts as cron jobs with Mac or Linux. There are a lot of great tutorials out there about how to do this. But as you can see, this video here that's showing you how to do this is 16 minutes long. If I went over this in this video, it would make this video way too long. So definitely check out these other resources down below if you do want that level of automation. I tried to make this video as simple for you guys as possible.
possible, but I know a lot of you are gonna be overwhelmed with the complexity, and so hopefully you guys can take advantage of just the very simple and easy tricks that I've showed you in this video, like being able to just press the buttons on your Siri shortcuts and display really any text or any number that you want to display, or just coming in here to the Block Clock Mini API documentation and just coding up a little string like this that we showed at the beginning of the video, and hopefully that is a good way for you to sort of get into learning more about these things, and maybe you get really comfortable with that over the next three months, and you come back to this video then, and you decide to dive a little bit deeper and learn a little bit more. And if you would ask me when I first got the Block Clock Mini if I was gonna be able to pull data from the Fed and then push it back up to the Block Clock Mini, I would have thought you were crazy. But if you do really just wanna sink your teeth into it, it is learnable, you can figure it out, and I am here to answer any questions that you might have. All right, guys, and like I promised at the beginning of the video, here we're going to put ETH price data on the Block Clock Mini. I'm just pulling the data from Gemini and gonna post it up there in the same way that we sort of ran that Fed script. So if we just run this, obviously messed it up, so let's run it again. And there it goes, some ETH USD price data. We can see up here that we are in fact triggering the maxis on Twitter. And we can see down here that Ethereum is ultra hard money. If you just believe in the crazy metaphors and don't think too hard about what they're telling you, you will also come to understand that Ethereum is ultra sound money. And that it doesn't matter that a cabal of insiders control every aspect of the token. If you guys use this video to come up with some crazy new design for your block clock, definitely at me and at NVK on Twitter and show us what you've put on there. I think it will be really interesting to see what the community as a whole can pull into their block clocks and maybe show some really interesting data like the US total debt or like the M2 money supply. Or maybe we can show like BTC ETH and see how Ethereum just goes to garbage over time. Really the limits to what you can do with this are endless. I did want to keep the video as short as possible, but I'm sure it's super long. And again, if you do have any questions or you do get stuck at any point, please go down in the comments. I do still respond to all the comments. And then also check the description for all the resources that we covered in this video, as well as a link to purchase a block clock for yourself. And then remember to come back here every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern for new videos. I love you all. Goodbye. <laughs>